Hello and welcome to Produced By. Just quickly before we begin, if you enjoy the show, please consider supporting it by joining our Patreon. You can choose from a list of memberships and will receive some exciting rewards. Thank you and back to the episode. Hello, Giorgio. Thank you for joining us today and welcome to the show. Hi, thank you for having me. So, Giorgio, can you please introduce yourself? Yeah, so uh, I'm Giorgio Venisi. I'm a feature technical director um, and I've been in the visual effects industry since 2017. And yeah, I'm currently based in Sydney, uh, but I've been most of my life working life. I've been working in uh, London uh, mm-hmm. for eight years. So can we start with your background, uh, where where you come from? What is it like yeah. growing up? Uh, <laughs> yes, I'm Italian, uh, specifically I'm some, from Sicily, uh, from a small town <laughs> called Trapani. So I basically grew up in a very small town, uh, but uh, in my family there's always been um, you know, sort of an artistic interest. Uh, my both my granddads uh, were into art. Uh, one of them I never managed to meet him, but he was um, a very good typographist. I think uh, the translation would be um, uh, in the seventies, and he he had very he was very skilled in drawing cartoons. And he I never managed to meet him, like I said, but he transferred that passion to my mom. And then she did the same to me. And then my other granddad was also like a hobbyist painter and sculptor. And, uh, you know, so I grew up in his house, uh, surrounded by his artistry and his interested, interest mm-hmm. in art in general. Uh, so since I was a kid, I was always surrounded by, you know, art. And at least I was drawn to be curious about it, for sure. And... Um, I think around age uh, eight or nine, because I was really into drawing since I was a a little kid, like I said, uh, my mom bought uh, for me a, like a magazine. Um, Mm -hmm. There was like an introduction on how to make comic books. Um, And it was made by Disney Italy, which in Italy, uh, people probably don't know this, but there is a very big, comic book production uh specifically we have like a weekly magazine it's called the topolino which means mickey mouse in italian uh Mm -hmm. and every kid in italy reads it like literally everyone and so they Mm -hmm. made this magazine where they will teach you how to and this will come out weekly they teach you how they make the stories they draw the characters how to you know to become both a storyteller and a and a you know and a illustrator Mm -hmm. and so she you know she saw that I like to draw and so she she felt that this was a nice way to you know feed into my curiosity and I think that really had a strong impact on me because then at that point I decided I wanted to be uh, a comic book a comic book artist so um, in Italy after middle school which ends at around age 13 you go into what I would describe as high school like from 14 to 19 right before uni and Basically, you can decide what type of high school you want to um, you want to attend, and there's like classical studies. You can do scientific studies, and because mm-hmm. of the passion I had for drawing and the fact that I wanted to become a, a a comic book artist, I thought I wanted to you know um, go with artistic studies. So um, I studied in a, a liceo artistico, which is the artistic high school we have. Uh, in my hometown, um, that uh, during that time, um, the first two years you get like a, a general understanding of art, and you do history of art, and you know just art in general. And then the last three years, you actually get to choose a, like a more specific path. Uh, mm-hmm. And in my school, you could choose between graphic design, architecture, and more sort of general painting, sculpting, and During those first two years, I was introduced to the concept of of architecture, and something really struck me about it. You know, I so I went from wanted to be a comic book a comic book artist to being very 
drawn into this thing that was architecture. Uh, I mm -hmm. think retrospectively, what I was really uh, struck by is the fact that architecture meant being able to uh, having good skills on both the artistical level, but also the technical level. Uh, it was just something that interested me somehow that I didn't expect it was going to as well. Mm -hmm. And so the last three years I studied architecture. And once again, uh, I, I loved architecture and I like to believe that in a parallel universe, <laughs> I'm an architect or I studied architecture at least because I think it's, mm -hmm. a, it's, a, it's a great meat of art. But, uh, you know, while studying architecture, you know, we were supposed to do everything the traditional way. So with paper and pencil and pen, because that's how our teachers wanted us to first learn uh, the, you know, the, the roots, the fundamentals of, of, the, of architecture. Mm -hmm. um, but on the sides, uh, completely unprompted, I would, uh, you know, do the 3D part of it as well. Um, so they did give us a little bit of a rudimentary sort of um, introduction to AutoCAD and all the 3D software for um, architecture specifically. But I did more research and I started looking into proper modeling and rendering. And as I was doing that, I sort of, uh, I ended up being more interested into the process of making the model and mm -hmm. making it look nice. Um, rather than the process of thinking of the project that I was trying to build, whatever, the, the museum, yep. the church, the house, whatever was the assignment, I was more interested into the modeling part at some point. Uh, I realized I would spend nights basically trying to make it look nice and appealing. And, and sometimes the, you know, being able to model it in 3D would actually give me ways to re-explore the original design and improve it as well. Mm -hmm. So since I was a kid, you know, like every kid of the 90s, early 2000s, I was, you know, I grew up with the Disney uh, cartoons and especially the Pixar ones had a very big impact on my, of my childhood. Uh, and I think at some point I started to be curious on how they actually make these movies, 3D mm -hmm. ones specifically. So all these things, you know, all these influences, all this, um, all these things I was drawn to sort of came in together um, and kind of showed me a path to follow in a way. Um, mm -hmm. I remember as a kid, uh, one of the first movies I saw at the theater was Nemo. And then I got, mm. uh, I think my parents got me, I don't know if it was the VHS or the DVD, but it had the special contents. And there was a documentary, I don't know if you've ever seen it, but there's a documentary in, in, the, in the special contents for Nemo, uh, where they show how Pixar uh, developed the technology to make it happen. Mm. Uh, the, you know, they, they, I think they went to Australia and they went scuba diving and they studied how water looked yeah. through the cameras. And it's incredible. They, at some point, they made it so realistic that they had to they had to dial it back because it was looking too realistic and needed to be more cartoonish <laughs> in a way. And, yeah, yeah. you know, I remember I watched that, this special content, I, I, I must have watched it, maybe not as many times as the movie, but, you know, close to. Yeah. I, I watched it so many, because I was, to me, it just looked like magic. You know, there were like artists and scientists at the same time. It was incredible. Mm. So as, you know, when I grew up and I got interested into 3D modeling, I, I realized, you know, maybe, maybe I, because these things look very far away from me, very unreachable. You know, someone in a very far away town in America is doing <laughs> incredible things. I'm in a small town in Sicily. What do I know? You know, yeah. but you know, with internet and the fact that I was actually starting to making models, and I could, mm -hmm. I could start to see what's behind a rendered picture. Oh, that's you know, I would would make it and be like, oh, that makes sense. So you, you can do it this way. I, you know, I started thinking, you know, how, how do you make a character then? Because, you know, I've made this nice architectures and there are nice still pictures, but how do you make mm -hmm. a character? How do you make it move, uh, et cetera. So at that point I was in my last year in high school. And so I went from being sold on studying architecture to finding any possible way to study how to make 3D yeah. animation or visual effects. Um, yeah, that was my journey towards getting interested into 
visual effects specifically. I like the progression from different stages of cre uh, creative industries, from uh, drawing to architecture, and now we are with uh, VFX. And as you mentioned with Finding Nemo, I haven't seen the special one for Nemo, but I read quite a lot behind Pixar's uh, process that, as you said, for example, they go to aquariums or to the zoo to see how uh, animals behave and to be able to replicate it even better. So it's uh, something I will have a look at with with the Nemo. And uh, although Nemo was released yeah, you know, quite a while ago, I, th I still think it's a beautiful and amazing film. So that was a great absolutely, example. Absolutely, absolutely. These movies from, you know, Early Pixar, I think they are masterpieces. You know, mm -hmm. they they really they really age well. And you know, animators have always have always worked with references, so it's not uncommon for studios to you know bring at least it did maybe not so much nowadays. But in the past, it wasn't uncommon for studios to actually bring people I don't know to in zoos to watch animals move and then try to replicate them uh, mm -hmm. in two D or whatever. Uh, what struck me with Nemo is that they were trying to understand the technical aspects uh, of photography, underwater photography specifically, how the light works, how it hits the characters, and that technical part that then ties in into the artistic endeavor of making a movie like that, it really struck me as a kid. So mm -hmm. it's it's sort of like all connected, uh, you know, during my journey into discovering my passion towards towards this field is something like I, I think it's something that always uh, really struck me but I never thought I could actually work in this field it, it felt really mm -hmm. far and unreachable because uh, obviously we don't have a strong uh, animation industry in, in Italy and so it just doesn't feel like something that you can easily achieve or study you know to, mm -hmm. uh, yeah from from my point of view at the time it didn't feel like so at this but yeah i guess it's a great example that uh it's uh you know your uh, wildest dreams can become a reality as yes, we'll find out soon about yeah, yeah. some exciting projects that you worked on uh, but can you tell us what are your next steps when you found out that you were interested in this so did you uh, continue studying or learn it by yourself so so the first thing i tried to do was you know finding places where they actually teach VFX. And I tried to find places in Italy, which there are a couple of uh, institutions that teach visual effects, but they mm -hmm. were very expensive. At least they're expensive for what my family could afford. They come from a very humble family. And so at some point, by chance, I had a friend who had a friend who studied in the UK. And totally by chance, I he told me that uh, he could study there because the you know at the, at the, at the time it was before Brexit, so uh, Europeans could access the um, the loan for studying in the UK. So you could go and study, and then instead of paying up front, you'd pay you know when you started working essentially. So mm -hmm. when I found out about that, I was like, all right, I guess I need to go to the UK. <laughs> so um, I put together some money um, with the help of my parents. Um, and I tried to study English. Uh, my English has never been really good, but it was really bad at the time because uh, it's usually the Italian school system doesn't prepare you very well for uh, conversational <laughs> English at least. Yeah. Um, gives you the basis, but uh, you hardly uh, are able to speak with people uh, once you finish school. Um, I feel like so it's similar the... in other countries. <laughs> I think so. Yeah, there are some countries that do it better for sure, you know, like Germany or more Nordic countries. I know they're mm -hmm. like Sweden, they talk incredible English. I don't know how they do it. But yeah, uh, yeah. yeah in Italy, it's not like that. Uh, so, so you know, I, I went to the UK and I took one year off uh, from studying because I needed... I needed two things. I needed more money. So my parents helped me to actually physically go to the UK and find a place where to, you know, sleep for the first month or so. But I needed mm -hmm. to find a job to actually fund my uh, my time there. And then I, at the same time, I wanted that to be a way to learn English better. So I, I went to the UK and I worked as a bartender for a year. And in the meantime, I applied for universities. 
uh, I had found a few universities in the UK which uh, looked like they, you know, they would give you a good uh, opportunity afterwards to actually, um, you know, make yourself a career. And I, yeah, after I, you know, I interviewed, I was also working on a portfolio in the meantime. So I was trying to create 3D models and, you know, digital drawings and uh, traditional drawings, anything, because in the UK, most universities, especially if there is a lot of uh, people applying for, for that university, you need to actually interview. And in, in my case, which was an artistic uh, field, you need to show a portfolio, you need to convince them that you are almost like a, a job interview, basically. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, so I put together a portfolio, I was studying English in the meantime, putting aside money, uh, working as a bartender. And after a year in 2016, I started studying at University of Hertfordshire, which is mm -hmm. uh, in Hatfield, about 30 minutes away from London. It's one of the top unis in, uh, in the UK uh, for, for this specific field. Uh, mm -hmm. But in all honesty, I only really understood that after I went to that university. Yeah. Like I didn't have a clear idea of what was the very good uni unis you should attend and what were the very bad uni. This mm -hmm. one was very close to to London, so it was convenient for me to go there. And when I went there for the interview, I, you know, I really liked it. The, the, the lectures, buildings, it just felt like it was a nice place to study. And so, yeah, so I studied there and I was there for three years. And I'm sorry, was yeah, it specifically VFX course? Yes, it was 3D animation and visual effects. So actually the course itself prepares also 2D artists. So it does also uh, 2D animation. Mm -hmm. So a bit like uh, when I was in school, the first part of your uh, journey, basically it's shared with everyone else. And yeah. then you choose a pathway in the second year. Uh, which could either be 2D, 3D, or visual effects. And that basically informs the specific skills that they will tend to teach you because visual effects is such a, and 3D in general, is such a broad uh, spectrum of things that you need to learn uh, mm -hmm. that they try to also specialize you a little bit early on so that you can actually you actually have valuable skills to get hired afterwards basically and thanks to your uh, background from studying architecture or learning vfx by yourself uh, did you feel like you had advantage was it kind of easier for you to start there um i think so i think that having when i started a lot of people had never open the 3D software. So even though you had to present the portfolio, the lecturers, when we had the interviews, also said it does not matter. It's not just about the portfolio. Sometimes there are people that don't have a portfolio, but they show um, that they are actually genuinely interested in pursuing this career. Maybe they have other artistic skills. You know, they show photography and they show um, traditional drawings. They show something else that it you know, that can let the lecturers know that there will be good candidates for this type mm -hmm. of career. Uh, in my case, I had actually uh, sort of studied uh, on my own time 3D. And so a lot of the notions that then I got taught in my first year, especially, they were, I was already at least familiar with. So I was able to, to you know, be quite fast with uh, learning um, the the things that, you know that they were teaching us and mm -hmm. in fact so much so that I, I started really hard during my uni because you know again i was coming from a humble family we were putting all our efforts together money wise you know i was working yeah. to make sure i could have enough money to support myself my parents would help the way they could and so i started really hard and for that reason paired with the fact that i already had a little bit of experience i actually had my first job at the end of my first year in uni and basically, I worked from from that first job. I worked every year afterwards. Oh, really? I the only time I stopped working is because in between I had to study and do exams, basically. But I was yeah, always yeah. working since, basically. So and it was definitely it, helped me. Like yeah, was it working already in the industry, or was it working in a pub or something unrelated? Oh no! So the the pub thing was, which was actually a hotel. I was working a, in a bar as a bartender. It was the year before getting in uni just to fund it. Um, mm -hmm. But then uh, the first job 
uh, I got after the first year of uni was actually already in the industry. So I got selected for the Creature Launchpad um, uh, from Frame Store. Um, wow, and I was also awesome. for, so that was my first project. I was really lucky as well, you know, again. Wow, in uh, the first year already working on Thor. Yeah, that's, yes, that sounds I was amazing. Very, very lucky. Mm -hmm. And I, again, I think. I think that's a story I should tell because uh, it's one of those things that maybe, you know, if there are people that want to, that are pursuing a career path, not even just visual effects, and they mm -hmm. hear this podcast, maybe they should know sometimes things don't uh, play out um, in a way, uh, how can I say, like maybe sometimes you think things should go in a way, but life brings you in a different direction and that is not necessarily a bad thing. Basically, the way I got the job uh, for, for Thor is a little bit of a background. Um, during our first year in uni, we would get just general broad strokes, you know, like ideas of how 3D works and visual effects works. Just a generalist uh, understanding, essentially, of the visual effects and 3D pipelines. Then, by the second year, uh, your main assignment was basically to make a short movie with a group of people. And so by that time, people would usually start choosing some specialization to follow and some things to, you know, learn uh, specifically. And then that's what they would do within that team. Maybe more than one yeah. thing, but, you know, it's already a way to sort of uh, indicating your path, essentially. So my initial idea was that I, before joining uni, was that I wanted to be an animator. Then when I joined uni, uh, because I had already had some uh, modeling experience and because, of, you know, I, I had been drawing always since I was a kid, uh, I found out that I was fairly okay at sculpting, at least for a first year student. So I was like, all right, I'm, I like this, you know, it looks like I'm okay at it. Maybe that's what I should do. So anything technical at that point, I wasn't interested. Like for that <laughs> first year, I thought my life was going to be modeling. So I made them, especially, specifically, I liked modeling creatures during that first year, like making dinosaurs and crocodiles and horses and just anything that's, you know, organic. I really, really enjoyed it. Um, but by the end of the first year, Lecturers were saying, try to look for a running job over the summer, uh, or maybe try to look for internships. Uh, just basically apply to anything you can. And I took their words seriously. So I, I think I've sent, I don't know, 100 applications, just anything that I could actually, you know, uh, yeah. apply for, I applied. And one of these um, applications were for a creature artist the launch the creature launchpad in in frames for creature artists now mm -hmm. at the time i had no idea i i thought i knew what a creature artist was but i had no yeah. i really had no idea my head it meant you make creatures which is what i thought i wanted to do so i was sculpting creatures i think yeah that's you know that would be amazing so when i did the interview um i then realized that that had nothing to do with what i you know with what <laughs> I was trying to, to do in yeah. uni because, and, and the whole thing I said before regarding in life, sometimes you think you want something and then life brings you somewhere else. And that's actually good. Mm -hmm. It's funny because that job that I got offered, it's basically what it, what's my career now. So what yeah, I'm doing yeah, right yeah. now, basically that's what it was. Cause I, mm -hmm. I, that first experience, you know, I, I was able to actually learn the job and then from there uh, at uni explored it further and studied further and the you know the following jobs gave me more experience and now that's basically what I'm doing I'm a creature TD um, mm -hmm. which involves a lot of technical scripting and you know just a lot of technical knowledge rigging uh, simulations physics all things that I didn't think I was gonna actually need <laughs> yeah, you yeah, know yeah. In, uh, for, for what I was interested at the time Mm -hmm. so yeah, so that that was quite funny that I I applied for something, not actually knowing what I was going for, and then mm -hmm. when I got the job, I realized oh that's different <laughs> because they started talking about simulations mm -hmm. and cloth and hair, and I was like that's a little bit different from what I mm -hmm. what I you know was expecting, but I actually loved it. it. That's yeah. the catch. And it sounds like 
amazing opportunity and experience because because being in the first year and working for such a company, such big amazing project, it's it's awesome. I hope it yeah. encourages other people to at least try to follow something similar. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, I mean, I, again, coming from my perspective, when they told me you're gonna work on a Hollywood movie. I I just couldn't believe it at the beginning. I was <laughs> like, this is my first job. I know a lot of people go through very long routes of you know being a runner, uh, mm-hmm. very valuable routes as well. You know, be, you know having to work closely, in maybe smaller company first, and then medium sized company. Just the fact that I was able to just jump into the big thing at the time at least, uh, it felt like this incredible achievement. Mm-hmm. You know. Uh, mm-hmm. Obviously, after you do it for a while, you realize it's it's an incredible job, but it's also just a job as well. And mm-hmm. yeah. you know, there's also a lot of value in smaller projects as well. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The the fact that it's a big project doesn't necessarily mean it has more value than something smaller. But yeah, for yeah, sure, course. like for a for a fresher, it felt amazing. For how long have you stayed there? So so basically. During my uh, years in university, I would always work during the summer break. So for four to five months. So I think the first time around was four months in Framestore. Then the second time around, I was on Venom uh, and I was in DNEG. So that was my second job. Mm-hmm. And then the third time around, which was basically when I, uh, I, I basically was graduating, um, I first went to Jellyfish and then I went to DNEG again. So every time during my uni time, it would be around yeah five five months a year. I would be working, and the rest of the time I would be studying. It sounds like once you graduated, your CV must have been very strong with a portfolio of such companies and projects. Yeah, I was again really really lucky. I was also lucky to find the right people along the way. I think so. When I for my first job, I joined Brainstore. Uh, I met Erika, which you worked with, Erika Vigilante. Mm. Uh, she used to be a lead in Framestore at the time. And, you know, it's not like I had anything special, but she saw, you know, some spark in me. I was very passionate about the work I was doing. Um, mm-hmm. And so the second time around when I got hired in DNEG the following year, uh, she actually referred me. She was like, you know, he worked with me. You, you can trust this oh, person. Nice. So... So, you know, I was, and then from there, having already a couple of experiences under your belt meant that by the third year, it was a little easier to find a job. Whereas mm-hmm. I know a lot of other people, maybe, you know, they were just about to put their foot into the industry. I had a head start by, you know, having already a couple of experiences on big projects. And so, yeah, yeah that meant for me, it was really easy to to actually find a new, a new mm-hmm. you know, new work and new projects. and and so yeah again i was really really lucky but i think it's not just luck so you do need luck in life for sure but i also know i was applying a lot you know i was try i was trying really really hard whereas i think a lot of people think i'm not good at it you know i'm not good enough why would i bother and they don't even try and so Mm -hmm. by not trying they waste a lot of opportunities uh, and that's not just for VFX, that's just in general. If you don't get yourself out there, like if you don't try to get to, to be seen, no one is going to look at you, essentially. So mm-hmm. it's, I think it's really important for everyone who tries to, you know, get into anything. Try, try, you know, try uh, to, to, to apply for that job that you think you're not worth, you know, you're not cut for. Try it out. You don't, you, you never know. The worst that can happen, they say no. So, like I said, yeah, first course. year I applied for, I don't know, hundreds of companies, but I think a lot of uh, colleagues in uni didn't actually even try because they thought they were never going to get the job. So Yeah, absolutely, I agree. And even uh, they either don't reply or they may share feedback or maybe they may get back to you later. So yeah, it's definitely worth nothing it. nothing to lose. And you never know if you send 20 applications and then you say, oh, it's not going to work. I'm not going to send anymore. You never know if the 21st could have been the one that you would get accepted into. So uh, it's definitely uh, worth continuing. Yeah. Absolutely. And also rejections are not, you know, you shouldn't take it personally. 
mm-hmm. so right now I'm working in industrial light and magic, and that's my second time in ILM. But before getting into ILM, I actually had interviewed with them three times. Mm-hmm. So, you know, <laughs> it took a few rejections to get a yes. Yeah. You know, if I had just thought, oh, I'm not good enough for this company, I'm never going to try again. Now I wouldn't mm-hmm. be here, you know, doing my job and being happy in what I'm doing. So it's yeah. really, sometimes it is really about actually, you know, putting some effort into trying and not thinking you're not good enough. And also, obviously, you know, put all the work uh, into producing the best portfolio, the best presentation, just whatever is your job, just to, you know, present yourself the best you can and and mm-hmm. the best uh, show, the best that you can produce and, you know, and then luck will come at some point you know yeah absolutely it's a great advice and coming back to your studies did you then uh, later in your studies start uh, focusing on a specific uh, you know discipline within vfx yes that's sort of another funny story uh, which ties <laughs> into the first thing you know the the fact that i got into the creature effects business by by chance essentially uh, or mm-hmm. by mistake rather because I applied for a creature position thinking it was something different <laughs> uh, right at the same time um, it was the end of the first year in uni and like I said during the second year we um, basically the main assignment is to make a movie with, with a group of people that you can choose to work with I met a, people, a, a group of people that were very driven and we we were so into it that we started planning for the second year movie at the end of the first year and so when mm-hmm. we were planning we were already thinking all right so who's gonna do what and obviously i wanted to do the models i wanted to make the creatures and sculpt them and make the pretty sculptures and we basically had every role that we needed fit fit but the only one missing was the technical rigging uh, creature effects guy because uh, at the time no no one wanted to do it it's the less I think it's less glamorous when you're starting to to learn unless you already have sort of like a programming mindset which I totally didn't have it's you know it's more glamorous to be the animator or the modeler because you can actually see the artistry sort of playing out on screen it's more direct you know to to experience that so yep. no one wanted to do it and so at some point I was like, all right, I guess I'm just going to do it. This. Then, you know, I'm just going to learn it. So I, I, I just went, you know, and looked a bunch of uh, resources on rigging. You know, obviously we were uh, being taught at the same time in uni, but the more uh, specialized uh, lectures were happening in second year. I needed to learn this before that. So I did a lot of research and started studying and, you know, As I was doing that, I actually found out that I really liked it. And by chance, again, (laughs) then I discovered that that was the job that I was about to get in French store. So so that's why, you know, it's really funny because it sort of all came together by chance once again. Mm -hmm. Like, I, you know, I, I get the job that I'm supposed to do something specific. And in the meantime, I discovered that specific thing I actually like to do. And I do it mm-hmm. only because no one else wants to do it, basically. And mm-hmm. so over the course of the summer, while I was working in Frame Store, I was also developing this second year movie, or I was prepping for the second year movie uh, with my, uh, you know, the group of people I was working with. And so I really got into rigging. And at the time, um, muscle simulation uh, was a fairly new thing for students, at least. I mean, in the visual effects business has been there for a while, but uh, it was very expensive and so very inaccessible for visual effects students. But there was a specific software, which is Ziva, uh, that was, it was in its infancy and it was available to try it out for students and, and experiment with. So as I was start, starting to learn rigging, I also tried to do some muscle sim. Uh, we had to make this horse for a second year uh, short short movie. And so I had to, you know, I sculpted all the muscles and I, I, you know, I solved the muscles, I simulated the muscles. And, uh, you know, as I was doing that, I realized that's what I wanted to do. Pair with the fact that I was doing the same thing in, uh, in Framester because I was doing creature effects there. I understood that that's what I wanted to research. So during my second and third year, I was basically focused really heavily on improving my rigging skills and my creature effects skills. 
as well as modeling because like i said i mean students uh student shorts there's a few people working on them like there's maybe three four five people max working on it and so at least the, the core crew and so you need mm -hmm. to do more things so i was yeah. at the same time as doing rigging and creature effects i would also do the modeling part uh so mm -hmm. i could keep some of the artistic um the initial artistic uh thing that i wanted to do as part of the process essentially i like that although there is uh, some uh, kind of luck involved at the same time it's also your willing willingness to learn willingness to put yourself out there and being proactive and then it's a great example that it kind of meets together and works out as as we discussed so yeah, it's, I, think, uh, I think you really need to try out a lot of things you know uh, especially like visual effects there's so many departments that do very different things you know you take groom for instance it's a whole world in itself and mm. which i tried out as well because also that sort of ties in into the creature realm and so you know you just kind of need to try things and sometimes mm -hmm. something that you think you're never gonna like i'll give you an example scripting i thought I hated it, and now it's my bread and butter, and I actually enjoy it a lot. You know, it's you just need to actually try. And sometimes things are scary just because you don't understand them fully. You've never really looked mm -hmm. into them. But if you mm -hmm. find yourself in the situation of giving them a go, then you might find that you actually enjoy them. So, yeah, yeah most definitely. I might become a master, yeah. If you want to boost your online presence, check out our digital marketing agency called Trailblazed. You can also enroll in our Skillshare course called the 10 tips on how to succeed in your creative career, which was inspired by the podcast. Lastly, make sure to subscribe to our weekly newsletter called Creative Spotlight to stay up to date with the show and more. Links are in the show notes. Thanks. Um, so, oh, you know, it, it, might, it might be something that you enjoy do for sure you know mm -hmm. and so then uh, how did you start looking for a job did you uh, continue working for any of the previous companies or how was it yeah so so um i only been in frame store once which is that first job but then basically i went to dneg I, I was in dneg three times mm -hmm. and now i've been in ilm two times and like I said, there was a, also a, more, a short period I was working in uh, Jellyfish. So mm -hmm. I sort of went back and forth between DNEG and ILM, really, essentially at that point. Because I knew the people there. And depending on the projects and all the, you know, the, the things that were happening, specifics of life, uh, I would, you know, go into a company or another. Right now I'm in Sydney. Yeah. And so that led me to, uh, you know, work for ILM in this, in this case. But in both companies, I always, you know, found uh like a very welcoming environment and so i think that's why i was able to also go back uh i was very lucky to work with people that were very interesting very nice people to work with and yeah so just in general it was also fairly easy easy to keep in contact i think that's very important for people to keep in touch uh you know with the people you worked with and mm -hmm. And yeah, just be nice in the workplace because that means people just, you know, are okay to work with you in the future for sure. Yeah. And I, it's another great example when you mentioned before the case with Erica when she recommended you because it's like yeah. about, it's kind of recurring theme, but on, on this podcast, but the power of networking and you never know who whom you meet and how people may help you in the future. So it was a great example. Uh, absolutely. And, you know, at the beginning I said, the uni I attended is one of the top in the UK for the visual effects specifically. I think the power, their power, mainly lies in the fact that they really uh, keep in contact with alumni and they mm -hmm. make sure these people can then um, go back to uni and talk to the students and do workshops and see what the students are up to and then help them uh you know uh getting a job into the industry so that's mm -hmm. definitely one of the most valuable things you know uh it's not just a portfolio it's not just wanting to try that's also another element that's very important just having that yeah. contact with people and yeah. i am colleagues in ilm with people that were 
above one year above me and one year below me and mm-hmm. we were all keeping in contact throughout the time that we yeah, got a yeah, job yeah. and that we're still in uni basically so the person who's with there's a person here in ILM who's he was sort of like my mentor when I was in, in uni. Like it was, mm-hmm. you know, I would send him rigs and he would review them because the lecturer would be like, oh, hit, hit him up. He would be happy to help. And I tried yeah. to do the same uh, with some people uh, afterwards and give back. So I think that's real power behind that for sure. Can you now tell us more about your role? What is it you do? Maybe uh, describe your, uh, it obviously differs, but your day-to-day activities. Yeah, yeah. So I'm a creature PT. Um, that basically involves two types of tasks usually. One, it's the rigging, and the other part is the creature effects. So rigging basically is the process of building the armature for the puppets, and then the animators are going to move. So um, basically, we create the skeleton behind it, behind every character. And then we create the controls, and so the animators then can pick the hand of the puppet or, you know, make the puppet smile. Essentially, all the anatomy behind it, we we are the people that make that work, essentially. And then the creature effects part of it happens after the animation and basically involves, it's also called technical animation sometimes. Um, it basically involves adding all those, uh, all these effects that are more complicated to achieve through rigs uh, from the animators. So for instance, the movement of, you know, uh, cloth, you know, crinkling of cloth, or mm-hmm. the movement of hair, or the deformations of muscles, uh, you know, beneath the skin, and, and so forth. So anything that's creature related that animators cannot easily achieve by deforming the puppet the puppet themselves, we basically put these effects on top of it. So yeah, that's that's mainly my, you know, my two areas of uh, expertise, and I enjoy both of them, I'd say. But I I think I'm more um, drawn into the creature effects side of things. It started out more into the rigging, and then uh, very quickly got into creature effects, and so simulation early on especially of muscle it was really interesting for me just being able to uh, you know show every single muscle behind a movement so that it feels realistic uh (laughs) more organic for me it was really interesting you know it was uh yeah something that i always love to to research and and work on that was my next question which one you enjoy more and why (laughs) i'd say yeah i said i burnt your question sorry Uh, but yeah i'd say yeah like i said i think creature effects rigging is really interesting because basically um you know there is sort of a standard way of creating like a standard rig of a biped of a of a quadruped so you know, a digidouble or a biped character always sort of has the same number of controls. But then, mm-hmm. depending on the show and depending on the animators working on working on it, they always have uh, requests or particular tasks that you really need to think about it. How to how to you know make that happen? You know, maybe the animator wants to do something particular with that rig that has never been done or is not usually done, and so you kind of really need to to think hard about it and then try to implement mm. the best solution that's more intuitive for the animator and more performance you get more performance out of it as well with creature effects you get more artistic in the sense that you sometimes you need the cloth and the hair to act you know actually most of most of the time because the type of work we do for hollywood movies everything is art directed you know um, yeah if it's uh, we i worked um for instance on um the uh, ABBA show that's in London. I don't know if you've, uh, if you've heard of it, the uh, ABBA Voyage. So there's sort of this um, uh, theater where the ABBA, uh, you know, dance around and they look young and they look like in, they're in the stage, but they're all digital. And I worked on that in, um, in London. And for that show, because they are dancing around all the time, we basically had to make this costumes not only hyper real and feel like they were realistic but also the movements needed to feel like by chance they were always perfect so they always were in tune with the song uh, the yeah. hair 
you know, would always fall in a particular way and the skirts would always create these nice worlds and would really, you know, with really fine detail, we are directed the way these garments needed to, to move. So it is more artistic that way, the creature effects part of things for sure. I was curious to ask you if uh, the work itself kind of always challenges you or if there is still new stuff to learn. So from what you said, it sounds like something that uh, keeps you, you know, to exploring, to learning and keeps you challenged all the time. Yeah, so especially, I think I think for both, for both rigging and creature effects really, because because it's about creatures and because we make all kinds of creatures, you know, yes, maybe if you do a biped, it feels a bit repetitive at times because that's just <laughs> another guy that you need to rig. But mm -hmm. um, for instance, uh, when I worked on uh, Ant-Man, on the last Ant-Man, there, there was a sequence where they went into this sort of cantina, Star Wars cantina-like scene with a ton of creatures that were all completely different. So there was like a, Like a guy, there was like a Chewbacca with dreadlocks, and the dreadlocks would float <laughs> around. And then there was another creature that was like a squid, and had petals, huge petals on its back. Uh, and another guy was made, of, it was like a broccoli guy, and his face, <laughs> all the florets of the broccoli were eyes. And we had to seem all of these things, so you understand there is no one way to do these things. So you, you always have uh -huh. to, you know, look at that character and think. How the heck am I gonna make it? Am, am I gonna make this work? You know, and it's really fun. Uh -huh. You know, it's really really challenging. So yeah, mm -hmm. I'm really again, really really lucky because working with creatures means you. It's a little bit like effects. You always need to find new ways, uh, new ideas. You know, new challenging things. You know, feathers, mm -hmm. muscle, hair, cloth, just whatever. It's yeah, it's definitely interesting. And you just mentioned a few, but is there a project or a specific asset that for some reason you enjoyed working on or challenged you a lot or for some reason is sharing or is worth sharing? So I think I mentioned it already. So the ABBA show, I think to this day is the thing that I'm the most proud of because mm -hmm. we we get to work on all these amazing IPs, uh, you know, this incredible Hollywood movies uh, with these incredible visuals because the companies behind these visuals have very skilled artists and I think after a while you get used to it you get used to the fact that this thing goes in front of a screen and a lot of people look at it and then it goes to a streaming service and then you know it's 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 cool at the beginning but then it just it's just part of the routine the ABBA show was something very different and I got to experience it myself I got to go to the theater and actually my mom Uh, and my mother-in-law, they, they, you know, they went to the theater as well to see it in yeah. person, and it's one of a kind experience because mm -hmm. you go to the cinema, and you do that many times in your life. But something like that, it's a very specific experience that you will remember for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah. definitely the ABBA show. I only, I think I only understood the value of it when I saw it in person for the first for the first mm -hmm. time. Um, I was so proud of the work we did, and to, I am still today. So what, <laughs> that was the first project that I did when I joined ILM. But obviously, like when I when I joined, I thought, cool, I'm gonna do dinosaurs, I'm gonna do Star Wars, <laughs> you know, I'm gonna do Indiana Jones and all the cool things that you think you're gonna. Make. And then they told me, uh, yeah, you are in this ABBA show. I was like, <laughs> ABBA? No way. I mean, I am, and I'm stuck for a year and a half on this project about four old people singing. But then it was yeah. one of the most amazing things, you know, I worked on so far. Mm -hmm. So I'm so glad and happy I was part of that. It was a very stressful project, but mm -hmm. the final result, it's really, really if you see it in person, it's really worth it. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So yeah, definitely that yeah. one. I like it. I will uh, Google it more after after recording. Yeah, you should um, you should go if you're in London. You should go watch it. And yeah, it's, it's an experience worth doing for sure. Mm -hmm. Yep. And I wonder. I don't want to sound like an interview question, but uh, what do you have like a specific position in mind that you would want to achieve in the future? Maybe like like a supervisor or something. So so far, I've always sort of liked the being able to work on you know on my things as a creature td not having to to lead or having to to 
necessarily have the responsibility, but definitely, mm -hmm. you know, it's something that I'd like to try it out as well, just for what I said at the beginning, which is, I think you need to try things so that you can understand if that's your path or your path is something else. So mm -hmm. I'm definitely interested. I think uh, in quite a few occasions, uh, I was able to, uh, you know, experience having to, um, I don't know, maybe not teach, but like, follow people lead. through learning how to work with something or uh, I, I wouldn't strictly say lead, but, you know, uh, sort of help people working with a setup or help people understanding a certain workflow. And I, I genuinely really enjoyed it. And I enjoyed mm -hmm. when people managed to achieve something out of that. So I don't know, maybe leading, maybe at some point teaching, I'm, I'm not sure. The answer I always give myself is that no matter what I'll do, I hope, I will enjoy it the same amount that I enjoy what I do right now, uh, if not yeah. even more. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yes, great, reasonable, and I, I agree and hope you will find it. Uh, with the rich portfolio of projects you worked on, what uh, do you have like a dream project that you would want to work on? Oh, man. Um, so, <sighs> it's tough. So, my dream when I you know, started working in this industry is that one day I would work with Pixar. And so I w one of their shows, I think it's just because it's the child in me, you know, that is still mm -hmm. looking at these Pixar movies, you know, Wally, -E, Nemo, uh, The Incredibles, mm -hmm. and just, you know, be amazed, still amazed at, the, at these movies. Um, but I did work on very cool feature projects, I think, with uh, both Dinek and ILM that were, you know, I'm, I'm I'm also very proud of these. So I wouldn't say it's necessarily a feature. I don't know, maybe something to the scale of Avatar, you know, where, you know, just make basically be part of a, of an effect that people go, wow, you know, that they, they make, mm -hmm. for, for, for a week, everyone talks about it because it's so, it's so great, you know. Like, I remember yeah. when Avatar, the new Avatar came out, which I went to watch in IMAX and I was blown away. There was... A particular a scene uh, where the detail of a hand of a Navi was then discussed for weeks on the internet because it looked so good, you know. And oh, yeah. I think I'd just like to be part of, you know, something like that, you know, being able to work on something that looks that good, you know. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, maybe it's not a specific project, but more like one project that really nails something that hasn't been nailed that good before. Yeah, for sure. No, it's completely understandable to be part of Avatar. I believe to be dream of many people, and I'm not surprised. Yeah, you know, and... it's it's really the pinnacle of the visual effects. You know, I mean, we have several examples. June came out recently. It's really, oh, yeah. really amazing. I worked on it, but I have a really small part. The mm. very cool things were done by other people, and mm -hmm. you know, so there are a lot of. Uh, movies that we get to work on that are amazing but yeah i just wish i could uh someday be you know that specific shot that everyone mm -hmm. wows you know i contributed a little bit maybe that, that's <laughs> yeah. for sure something that I, i'd like mm -hmm. to have and talking about cinema experience this is the question i like to ask but uh, when you go to cinema or watch the film somewhere are you able to enjoy the film without thinking about how this and this was made uh that's that's a tough question so uh <laughs> it's really it's really really hard i don't know i know some people manage to to just go and not think about it um i think if the movie it's visual effects heavy i just cannot see the movie without <laughs> actually you know starting to look for details or mm -hmm. you know it's, i i have this thing i've uh, i i don't know if i've ever talked to any of my colleagues about it. I think I did at some point where sometimes when I can feel the scene, it's basically all CGI. I, I start to look at the, the scene and I can imagine the 3D version of that. Like I can imagine to move around in Maya or, you know, whatever <laughs> and actually look through you know, all the things mm -hmm. that are broken. It's, it's really weird. I think it's because we are used to, we have to do it in daily session. And, you know, we just have to be very scrutinous and just, you know, look at pixels uh in detail and then go back into a 3d software and and fix it and see what's behind the magic that whenever i see it on on the big screen 
it just feels like a new daily session and I need to go back to my duty <laughs> software to fix whatever needs to be fixed. Especially if I worked on it, it's really hard. You know, when characters are on top of a plate, people feel mm -hmm. fine. I can see the play. I can see the 3D <laughs> character. It's really, really hard for me to, you know, they don't yeah. feel glued to my eye because I'm, I'm just too used to it, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's completely understandable. Also, I wanted to ask you, uh, because of your recent experiences, you moved to Australia. Uh, how, how do you find it? Because you moved across the whole world. Uh, can you share us more, not uh, when it comes to work, but maybe from the... Uh, culture experience uh, what is it like to live in a completely different place tell us yeah, more so, about it so um i might be a little bit biased right now because i've always i've only been in uh, sydney for a couple of months so i'm still in the honeymoon period uh of when you move to, <laughs> to a new place uh, whilst I, i had been in london for eight years um and so i know the good and i know the bad of uh being in london I'd say that because I'm Sicilian, and so I come from a very warm uh, part of uh, Italy, of the country, it feels more natural for me, uh, you know, a climate, a weather like the one in Australia, it feels more similar. Also, Sicily, it's an island, so I grew up seeing the horizon of the sea, and in mm -hmm. London, you, you can't do that. Yes, you get the Thames, but it's not the same thing, obviously. <laughs> and so if you grew up with that, you know, uh, sort of harbor city sort of mindset, you kind of, at least in my case, I always try to find it in the places I visit. Whenever there's a harbor, wherever there is a beach, maybe I, I just instantly feel at home. So mm -hmm. I feel that, uh, you know, if Sydney was much closer to home, then it would be the perfect city. <laughs> But obviously mm -hmm. it's also really, really far away. Um, yeah. It's definitely an amazing experience, though. Anything is different. Uh, if you are European and you you've never seen Australia, it just feels like a different planet sometimes because the animals <laughs> are different. You know, it's uh, there's a lot of Asia. Well. I mean, you know, there's the meme of uh, things will kill you all the time, uh, <laughs> which is probably not true. Uh, but you definitely need to learn things that not you're not used to, like you know. Uh, don't swim in the harbor, for instance, because sharks are mm. there. You know things that I never, oh, that I would never yeah. thought in my hometown. But, mm -hmm. but yeah, but it's it's an amazing it's an amazing place, definitely. There's some uh, culture shock that you experience, maybe something embarrassing or awkward that you would be willing to share. I'm trying to think. Oh, well, Vegemite was a cultural shock because <laughs> in the What eight years I was in the, so it's a spread. In the eight years I was in the UK, I never had Marmite, which is a big regret. I will try it out when I go back to London. Vegemite okay. is the Australian version. But when I got to Australia, it was one of the first things I wanted to try. I'm like, I need to try this. And mm -hmm. I, I don't have a strong opinion. I think I understand why people get divided. Uh, but that was a, I don't know if it's a cultural shock. You can be considered a cultural shock. But yeah, jokes aside, I think one of the things that are really different uh, in Sydney compared to, say, London, is that it really mm -hmm. feels there is a, a big Asian community. And so mm -hmm. um, you experience a lot of China, a lot of Korea, you know, a lot of India as well. You can experience these things in London as well. But in here, I have a feeling they feel a bit more authentic, probably because they're closer to, you know, the countries where this Uh, cultures come from and so mm -hmm. it's really interesting from someone that comes from Europe you're used to the whole you know uh, set of European cultures to be exposed to these new fairly new cultures uh, to this level of authenticity you know mm -hmm. uh, there are entire areas of Sydney there is you know only Chinese people only Korean people so if you go there you go to a restaurant uh, You know, you get something that's quite close to what they would have back at home, and so it's it's like you get a you do a little trip to an Asian country that you've never visited, yeah. for instance. Mm -hmm. And so that's and quite cool, actually, about Sydney. Also, meet a lot of Europeans, or not really. So there are there definitely are uh, Europeans, but there's definitely more people from Asia, yeah. from my experience in Australia, obviously. Yeah, there is a lot of people from Singapore uh, as well. Uh, you know, so it's it's really multicultural, like London. But I, 
but obviously London is more European driven uh, and here it's more a Asia driven. So mm -hmm. um, I'm used to the multiculturalism, which is a very cool thing. Uh, it's nice to experience new cultures as well um, to this magnitude, because obviously you can find uh, you know the Chinese area or the you know Chinatown or maybe you know the, the Italian area in London as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I just feel like it's in a different scale for the Asian uh, countries here in, in Sydney, specifically at least. Yeah, so so sounds like a beautiful place and that you like it there. So hope absolutely uh, yeah. you will enjoy it. Yeah, I know we discussed this a bit before uh, about. Um, what would be your uh, future position but uh, as we will be approaching the end uh, do you have like any specific plans in mind right now or you know uh... my like next like closest plan i have is to visit japan since i'm so close because that's oh, yeah. <laughs> a long bit of my... <laughs> jokes aside like long-term plans right now i'm not sure i am I feel like I'm in an industry that's changing very fast. Visual effects has always has always been evolving fast because of the nature of the industry. It's a technical field, but right now it seems like it's evolving at ten times the the speed, and it will in the future years. So I don't know if the way we do the work it's going to be the same or it's going to evolve into something else. What I know is that I I really enjoy uh you know doing visual effects it's what i've basically always done since i started working and mm -hmm. it's all i like to do and i've liked to do so far so i i hope this you know uh art does not die in the future you know yeah. i welcome automation uh for sure when tasks are tedious or repetitive but i think i i really hope for this art not to just become you know just like a money making thing yeah, of uh, without yeah. any human input behind it i mean it's unlikely that's going to happen but just generally i think this is a very passion driven industry um and the people that work in this industry do it because they like it uh, mm -hmm. it's one of those jobs that you really do it because you like it it's almost a vocation yeah. at times so yeah. Yeah, I, I hope in the future I can keep doing this job and I am, you know, as driven as I've been so far, for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, tell us, Giorgio, where people can follow you or where they can oh, see your work. Me. Not really an influencer of any kind, uh, but Not yet. If, you want to, <laughs> <laughs> if you want to, uh, you know, get in contact, get in touch, you know, maybe discuss some cool VFX topics. Uh, maybe you can uh, hit me up on LinkedIn and uh, be happy to, you know, to answer. If you're a student and you want some guidance, maybe, uh, you know, happy to help. Uh, always mm -hmm. been so, yeah. You got a portfolio there or do you have a portfolio website? Uh, so, yeah, there is a website. I think it's georgiapenisi.com. <laughs> but it's not <laughs> my heart. I can't remember now. I think it is. Uh, it uh -huh. is in my LinkedIn, though. So yeah. you can check it out from there, and there's a showreel that you can see some of the recent works. Although it needs mm -hmm. to be updated, probably. And yeah, and if you probably look hardly enough online, you'll find my student films as well. Uh, mm -hmm. In one of them, I'm actually one of the actors in the movie, so you can actually <laughs> see my pretty face <laughs> uh, acting as a cowboy with a CG. Oh, wow. Course. I will need. I will. I will Google it for sure. I'm curious. <laughs> and uh, yeah. I actually forgot to ask you about the uh, personal projects. Do you also have time or uh, passion, or do you do uh, do you work any on uh, you know personal projects? Yeah. So I used to when I started the career, I used to do loads of personal personal projects. I used to spend so many hours. Uh, you know, I would come back at home and keep working. And then in the weekend, I would just also work. And then, you know, at some point, I just started to also enjoy life. Because obviously, if you do it as a full-time job, you do it eight hours, very often more than eight hours a day. <laughs> and so you are really involved into that already. And by the end of the day, I, you know, I like to get away from the computer and start doing other things. But, mm. um, you know, I don't, 
I, I think at some point maybe I'll get into do some personal projects as well. But yeah, I used to do it a lot more. But right now I'm just, you know, taking it easy a little bit and enjoying other aspects of life as well, which I think it's really important. And enjoy the local culture. Enjoy Absolutely. the new place. Yeah. So uh, as, as we are just at the end, uh, is there something that you would want to share or, uh, you know, promote yourself or something I should have asked and did not ask you? Uh, um, not really. Nothing to promote myself specifically. Uh, maybe just a final message to the people that are trying to get into this industry. Don't be too discouraged right now by the times. They are really tough mm -hmm. for everyone. But like everything, you know, it's up and downs. Uh, after a moment of crisis, there's always a nice moment of things going in a in a in a good direction. And uh, you know, just you know, keep trying to learn things that you like. Keep try to explore things that you like. And you you know, if you put the right amount of time and passion, you'll find your place for sure. So yeah, just don't be discouraged. Keep trying. Uh, and yeah. I guess mm -hmm. that's that's my final message. That's perfect advice to finish with. I just uh, have to mention, which we haven't mentioned, that I actually worked with Giorgio. We worked on a project that uh, I think hasn't been announced yet, so I cannot say what was it. No. But it was always <laughs> always a pleasure to work with Giorgio. I really enjoyed it. And I'm happy that you joined me on the podcast. And uh, thank you so much for joining Yeah, same goes for you, Thomas. It was amazing to to work with you, and I'm I'm really really happy to you know to have been part of the podcast. I think you're doing an amazing job. I watched the other episodes, uh, you know, during these days. Yeah, and, yeah, Thank it's you. really really nice. Really, uh, it's it's really nice to hear people's stories, and I I heard Fernando's story as well, uh, <laughs> yeah. which was really, really interesting because I you know I also worked with Fernando. And I think it's really inspiring. So yeah, you're doing a great mm -hmm. job, mate. Thank you. I really appreciate it. And I will stay in touch. Thank you, George. All right. Bye. Thank you. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed the show, please leave us a five-star review on your favorite podcast app, get in touch to provide your feedback, or share any ideas for future guests. Thank you, and see you soon.